today's lecture, we're going to talk about large-scale chromosomal abnormalities or chromosomal mutations. I'd like to focus on two different parts in this lecture. So the first thing we want to focus on is changes in chromosome structure is the first thing. And the second thing is changes in chromosome number. Whenever we talk about these different types of changes, I want to first focus on one of these chromosomes and tell you exactly what the different parts are, just so we can tell. So whenever you see these diagrams, whenever you see a letter with a shaded region next to it, so like A, B, C, D, etc., those are different genes. Okay, so this is gene A, gene B, gene C, gene D. Um, whenever you see a gray area between those two genes, it's an intergenic region. So uh, it's a non-coding region. And then whenever you see a little tiny uh, sphere here where the chromosome's indented, this is a centromere. Okay, this is a centromere. So let's talk about changes in chromosome structure. And in this lecture, actually, uh, you'll notice that sort of a lot of different changes that can result, but once you understand the change, there's not really much more to it um, at the introductory level of genetics, at least. So to give you an example, whenever you have a change called a deletion, all that means is this is the original chromosome here at the top. Uh, there's you know, no issue there. But if we do have some chromosomal abnormality and it is a deletion, what happens is you lose uh, a couple, you know, one or two genes. Uh, so in other words, this region here containing gene E, gene F, and the intergenic region is deleted. So now we just have D to G. So that's a deletion, you know, pretty straightforward. Um, some people also call it a deficiency. They call it a deficiency. Uh, there's different types of deletions. So an intragenic deletion would be a deletion within a gene, right? So a portion of a gene, so a portion of one of the shaded areas above. And then a multigenic deletion would be a removal of two or more genes. Deletions result in something called null mutations. In other words, what can happen is, especially if you have an individual that's um, uh, haploid, is if you have like big A, little a, and you delete the little a, excuse me, the big A, then the little a will show through. Uh, so really the effect of a deletion, whether it's severe or not, really depends on, um, you know, exactly um, what allele is deleted. There's another type of chromosomal abnormality called a duplication. And this is the presence of a repeat in a particular chromosome. So again, the original chromosomes at the top here, if we had a duplication of genes E and F, we would get a chromosome that looked like this, EF, EF. At first glance, you might think, ah, you know, Okay, we replicated, we have a duplication, not a big deal. We still have the genes, and in fact, we have more of them, right? Uh, it's possible it's no big deal, but in reality, actually, it could often be a very big deal because um, gene products or the proteins that are produced, uh, you often want to make sure that they're produced in a certain ratio compared to their other um, counterparts or subunits that are used uh, to form a larger protein complex. So. If you do have duplication of genes, and that does result in extra protein being produced, that could ac actually be very deleterious to an organism. There's different types of duplications. There's things called tandem duplications, uh, where the repeat is inserted right next to the original sequence in the chromosome. Uh, there's insertional duplications. That occurs when the duplicated fragment is inserted elsewhere in the genome, so not right next to the original fragment. Um, Something else to think of is this, that uh, duplications can cause additional problems beyond the ones I mentioned in the previous slide. So for example, um, what happens is if the duplicated region is inserted within a different gene, literally disrupts the other gene, then you can get gene breakage, and then you could have uh, you know, major problems where that other gene is not expressed uh, properly or not expressed at all. This is sort of an example of a problem with uh, gene dosage. Uh, it's the first example that I gave uh, in terms of problems with uh, duplication. And so in this slide, what you see is you'll actually see, okay, here's a normal situation, right? Genes A, B, and C in a chromosome. The protein products are produced. They form a protein complex, right? So these three subunits form a larger protein complex. Uh, and then it's used, you know, to help embryonic development in some way to produce an organism. This is obviously a general slide, so the exact pathway here is not important. It's not even listed. You know, it's just a generic example. Now let's say we have a duplication of gene B. We have a duplication of gene B and we have two of them and you know all other things are, are equal. Now we're gonna have twice the protein product. We're not gonna get a formation of the proper um, um, structure of three subunits, rather we're gonna have four subunits. And that could result in some uh, abnormality in the organism. Uh, here it's just indicative of the, uh, um, the organism not having stripes, but rather having these, uh, these splotchy marks on the organism. There's other changes in chromosome structure as well. There's things called inversions, and this is the flipping of a DNA within a chromosome, the rotation of a DNA with, within 180 degrees. Uh, this can cause problems for many reasons, right? 
uh, could cause problems in the reading frame if there's a breakage of the chromosome within a gene. Uh, and there's other problems you can imagine as well. And there's different types of inversions. And on this slide, I really just want you to focus on the title uh, and just you know a few aspects of the diagram. We're not going to go into this diagram in extreme depth, so just keep that in mind. I only want you to know the things I mentioned right now. So the first type of inversion is a paracentric inversion, and this is one that does not involve the centromere. So you could see that here's the original sequence, and here the sequence is flipped, but it's not flipping the centromere. You know, the, the portion that's chopped out and flipped is not involving the centromere. The other type I want you to know, and again, same rules apply. We're not going to go through all the details on this slide. Uh, if you do have questions, let me know if you want to go over them together. But uh, really, I want you to focus on this. There's a pericentric inversion, and a, if it's a pericentric inversion, it does involve the nucleus. So you could see here that we have a flipping, right? And uh, the centromere used to be here, but we're flipping C, D, and E, those three genes, and the location of the centromere has changed. Uh, pericentric inversions can also often, often, excuse me, can often be much more severe than uh, paracentric inversions, and the reason is is because um, there can be a lot of problems uh, during uh, during cell division because of the fact that the centromere location has changed, uh, and you know the two chromosomes no longer have centromeres at the same location. Uh, another thing I want to mention here is how do you remember para and peri? How do you separate it? So the way I pe separate it is I think peri, sort of like a pear, like the fruit. You know, it's not spelled the same, but you know, sort of like a fruit. And I think of the centromere as being a pear, or looking like a little piece of fruit. And so in other words, pericentric inversions involve the pear, right, involve the centromere. That's how I remember it. Okay, uh, here's some other things I just mentioned on the previous slide, but just to make sure you have them in your notes. There's other types of chromosomal changes called translocations. And translocations, what that is, is when you have exchange of parts between non-homologous chromosomes. So you have a breakage of one chromosome of a certain number from a certain parent, and then it's switched to a different numbered chromosome. Uh, and that can cause a lot of problems, as you can imagine, uh, because you're uh, going to end up with gametes that have du duplicate copies of some genes where they have no copies of other genes. So translocations can cause uh, issues. Okay, so those are the different types of changes in chromosome structure I wanted to focus on. Now let's go ahead and talk about the changes in chromosome number. The first type of uh, change in chromosome number is something called aberrant euploidy. And what that is, is that's a gain or loss of an entire complement of chromosomes. So in other words, humans are diploid, right? We have 23 pairs of chromosomes, two of each type, right? So two number ones, two number twos, two number threes, etc. Aberrant euploidy would be as if all of a sudden we had three of each type chromosome, or four of each type. Uh, that's something that humans cannot handle, that's lethal in humans. So it's, it's, you know, theoretically it exists, but it's something that humans cannot handle. Uh, plants are actually organisms that can handle that um, very easily sometimes, and it's an event that actually leads to speciation of many different uh, plants. There's another type of change in chromosome number called aneuploidy. And aneuploidy is the gain or loss of an individual chromosome. So in other words, a classic example in humans is this last one I've listed at the bottom, Down syndrome. That's a classic one. So you have three number one, excuse me, three number 21 chromosomes. Uh, other examples in humans are Turner syndrome, where you have a female who has only one X. The zero stands for nothing, right? Uh, and then Klinefelter syndrome, where there's a male, but he has two Xs. And all these things um, result all these disorders result from something called non-disjunction. And non-disjunction is, is uh, when you have abnormal division of chromosomes during meiosis. Here's showing you euploidy in action. Right? It's showing you how it's caused by this non-disjunction during meiosis that we talked about. So in meiosis 1, you could see that um, you know, we're going to have duplication right, prior to meiosis 1. Then we have division of homologous chromosomes. Okay? It takes us through meiosis 1. Uh, then what happens is after that we have separation of um, um, uh, excuse me <laughs> separation of uh, the sister chromatids uh, word excuse me for a second separation of the sister chromatids and in this situation we have sister chromatids pulling apart in a normal fashion we get two normal gametes here we don't though right there's non disjunction they divide unevenly and so we have one abnormal gamete here that has one too many of a given chromosome and then one here that has one too little in other words it has nothing. This is, let's pretend this is an uh, individual producing sperm. So here's one, two, three, four different sperms that you could see here in red. And then what this diagram is showing you, I don't think it's 100% apparent, is here comes an egg flying in out of nowhere, right? So each of these sperms has the potential to mate with this egg. That's what that's showing you, a normal egg. 
And then this is saying these are the zygotes that were resolved. So it's just sort of taking the point um, a little bit further, showing that if you have half the sperm here that are abnormal, you're going to have half the zygotes that are abnormal, right? One too many of a given chromosome number, one too little. There's another example of non-disjunction that leads to something called monosomy uh, in, in um, humans uh, in regards to the X chromosome. And this is something that results in, um, uh, um, in females. Uh, and these females are born sterile. About 1 in 3,000 female births have this. Uh, and it's something though, interesting to note is that um, humans can tolerate monosomy with their sex chromosomes. But I'm not aware of any examples where humans can tolerate monosomy, monosomy with um, their autosomes. So you can't have it with 1, 2, 3, 4, those chromosomes all the way up to 22. It ends up being lethal. So that's something that's just sort of interesting to note. I, I don't know the reason for that. Um, I'm sure there's some type of evolutionary implication. I'm not quite aware of it myself. There's another example of trisomy, something called Klinefelter syndrome. And this is an example where a male has two X's as opposed to one X. Uh, again, you know, fairly rare, about one in a thousand births, uh, male births. And the males here are sterile, right? So they're sterile. There's other examples of trisomy where you can have a gain of a chromosome and an autosome. Uh, certain ones can be tolerated, so 8, 13, 18, 21, for example. Uh, and 21 is that classic example of Down syndrome. And this is that right here. So again, just we already covered it, but showing you tr um, trisomy 21. Uh, the phenotype that results has variation, right? So there's different variations in the phenotype uh, of an individual with Down syndrome. Uh, and it happens about 1 in 700 births, though the risk of Down syndrome does increase with both maternal and paternal age. And this is what that diagram shows you. So uh, this is just showing you the maternal age, but there's similar diagrams that have just come about in the last few years regarding paternal age. So uh, if a human um, uh, female is around, you know, around 20 years of age or so, her odds of having a child uh, with Down syndrome is about 1 in 2,000. Flash forward a decade, it's about 1 in 900, so still pretty low. When that, that same woman is 40 years old, her chances are, are 1 in 100. Again, very low, 1% chance, right? But much, much higher than these chances earlier in her lifetime. And after age 30, we see this exponential increase in the... Um, the possibility of having a child with Down syndrome. Uh, by the time you hit 50, which, which is past chi childbearing years sometimes, uh, but it is still possible to bear a child at that age, uh, about 1 in 12. Right? So you could see that there, there is an increased um, risk of Down syndrome and most likely due to this increased rate of non-disjunction. So that's today's lecture talking about chromosomal mutations, focusing on the changes in structure and then the changes in number.